All right. Good morning, everyone. I believe I'm on and I'm looking good, right, Joshua? I'm looking good, right? All right. There we go. I'm in the right spot and we got audio. Everybody can hear me. How many is ready for the word this morning? Amen. All right. I am glad everyone is tuning in. I'm going to tell you that that word last week that Brother Landy brought was extremely, extremely encouraging. And it's also challenging. You know, it's challenging to have that belief that that receiving your healing is just as easy as receiving forgiveness. That's, That's not the easiest thing to do. But that's what Jesus asked. He asked that question. He said, which is easier? So, you know, we've got to look down inside. We've got to look at the word and what is God speaking to us? And, and that, that right there really was speaking to me. And so I've got to stand by faith, believing, believing God in the same way that I believe God. And I have confidence that I, my sins are forgiven, that I, I am in the family. I am called a child of God. The same way I have confidence that I am healed in the name of Jesus. All pains got to go out of my body in Jesus name. All sickness, must, disease must leave in Jesus' name. See, I've got to be able to stand on that and believe that. So, uh, Brother Landy, thank you so much for that word that we had last week. That was so good. God is good. And this morning, this is going to be part eight of the importance of faith. The importance of faith. And church, you know, I, we're, we're, we're going to be finishing up this series either this, this might be it or maybe one more. I'm not sure. I've, I've been looking at some other things too. And, and it's starting to burn in me the next thing to do. And when I start to feel that, that means it's about time to move on. Even though I've got other stuff that we can bring. So I, I'm going to be praying this week. Okay, do I do one more with this, you know, in the next couple of days? Or are we going to move on? Because I'm feeling that in my chest. And see, that's what we've got to do. We've We've got to make sure that everything that we do, we are going by the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. And we have got to tune into that and make sure that our antennas are up looking for, uh, uh, for, for God to be speaking, you know, on the, on the inside. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Boy, I just feel the Lord in here this morning. This is good. God is good. And I'm looking forward to what he's got for us here right now. Because God wants to do something in you. You, You're here listening to me. I've got a few right in front of me. But then you're listening on there at home. Uh, God's got something for you this morning. Tune in. Be ready. Listen to this. Now, we're going to go over a couple things Yeah, we've heard before. And and that we've gone. We need to just hit just a couple of quick things. And I'm going to talk this morning about some of the uh, 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 certain aspect of Abraham's faith that I think that we've got to look at. And maybe we've heard it before, but we've got to look at it just one more time because there's something I believe that God wants to do in you. And there's a challenge I have for you. So before I get to that, I want to talk about a couple other things. In Romans chapter 12, verse three, it says, God has dealt each one a measure of faith. And right now I want to go to prayer and I want to thank God for that right now. Father, I just thank you that you have given each one of us a measure of faith. And Lord, you said to grow our faith. And so, Lord, I thank you that this morning, through this word, that we are growing our faith. That measure that you've given us, we are going to another level. Lord, we're not satisfied with where we're at now. Lord, I thank you that you bring us to another level in you this morning. In Jesus' name. Lord, I think our hearts are open. Our minds are open, ready to receive what you have for us. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See, we're all given a measure of faith, and we've been talking about that. And if we all have a measure of faith, we know that we're to grow that measure of faith. And, but, you know, I asked the question before, and I want to ask it again. Why does it seem like sometimes, you know, our faith doesn't work? You know, like, uh, I've got this measure of faith, but, oh, wait, uh, you know, I don't see this happening in my life. I see so-and-so. They look like they're doing good. They look like they got the blessings of God. Look at December, De- Deuteronomy 28. And all these blessings shall come upon you and what? Overtake you. That's what it says. It says the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. But look there, there's because. This word because. Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So if I'm obeying the Lord, the blessings are going to what? Overtake me. I have to believe that, church. 
And so if I'm not seeing that in my life, if it doesn't seem like the blessings of God are coming like a wave, like just it's coming over me, I have to look at myself and go, am I obeying the voice of the Lord in every single area of my life? Every single area. Am I giving of myself? Am I giving of my time, my talent, my treasure? Am I loving others as myself, as Jesus said to do? That was his commandment. He said, this is a a, a new commandment I've got for you. He said to love others, period. Nothing else. No, no other extras. None of that. Just love one another. So am I doing that? So these are the things I begin, because see, that's being obedient to the voice of the Lord. When I'm loving others and I'm following that commandment, I am obeying the voice of the Lord because it wasn't a question mark. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a command that said, love others. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And it wasn't love others as long as they're nice people. Or as long as they look nice. Or as long as they act nice. Or as long as they say and do everything I like them to do. Okay. No, it was love no matter what. I never stop loving. So I've got to obey the voice of the Lord. And all these blessings will overtake me. Overtake me. Now, see, the writer here in Deuteronomy, he goes on to list all the blessings. And I want to suggest to you to go, go and look at that and read that because all of those blessings are yours. And you might be thinking, oh, God just, you know, he randomly blesses people here or there, you know, that it's just a, a random thing. Or, and I'm just, I'm just not one of the lucky ones. No, every promise Every blessing in the word is yours. You just got to get it. You've got to go get it. Hallelujah. Look at this statement here. God's blessing. God's blessing us began, began in the garden from the very beginning with the original blessing and continues throughout the word. Now, this was something we talked about in Blessed to Be a Blessing the first series we did at the very beginning of the year. And God was speaking to us and we said, you need to be blessed so you can bless others. That was the word. God wants to bless you, 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 all of you listening, everyone in here, so you can bless somebody else. And you say, well, it doesn't seem like that's happening. Obey the voice of the Lord in every single area of your life. And believe God and say all the blessings that are in the word, they're going to begin to overtake me right now. Overtake me. Hallelujah. They're going to overtake my family. They're going to overtake my household in the name of Jesus. And begin to pray those things. And begin to speak those things. In Ephesians 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every blessing. 2 Corinthians 1 20, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him. Amen. To the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Look, it's a guarantee. You can take it to the bank that all the promises in the word of God are yours. They belong to you. They belong to me. Now look at this statement by Mark Batterson. We did this in the Blessed to be a Blessing. You can't just claim the promise of God like a game of pin the tail on the donkey. But every promise has your name on it. Every blessing in the Bible is part and parcel of our spiritual birthright by virtue of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Woo, that's good. Every single one. Now look, you don't name it, just name it and claim it. No, you position yourself for the blessings of God. You've got to walk worthy. You've got to position yourself. And it starts by kneeling at the foot of the cross. And when you do that, you and you take up your cross and you follow him. It says, how often? Daily. That's what the word said. Take up your cross and follow him daily. And when you do that, then the blessings are going to begin to overtake you. So, I asked this question before. I'm going to ask it again. Let's put it on the screen. Here's the question. What is the difference between believers who obtain the promises of God and believers who struggle to obtain the promises? What's the difference? 
And we know this and we, we did the answer because look, it's not that, oh, you're not good enough. It's not that they're better than you. Those other people, they're better and you're not. That, that's not what it's about. God is no respecter of persons. See, we said that. He doesn't look at the person across the street and go, oh, they're nice and attractive and they have all those qualities. And, 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 no, that's not what God, God's not looking at the outside. God's not looking at that. God doesn't play favorites. We play favorites. We have our people and we have them ranked. Up. I really like so-and-so. I really like so-and-so. And you know what? There's no problem with that because you know what? We're human. We're going to look at it. We're going to see, okay, I like that person and I'm going to hang out with that person a little more in that one because you know what? I like their company and they build me up. They're not tearing me down. That's okay. But see, God, he's no respecter of persons. He's not doing any of that. He's just looking for the ones that will. The ones that will what? Obey me and my word. And so I can bless you. That's it. He's not playing favorites. So the answer to this question is one has developed and grown his faith more than the other one. That's the answer to this question right here. Let's put the answer up on the screen if we have that. One has developed and grown his faith faith more than the other one has. In other words, that one, he's in the word. He's listening to what God is saying to him. He's applying it. He's speaking it. She's speaking it. You know, they're, they're doing it. That's the difference. God doesn't reward someone because he likes them more than someone else. He rewards the one who has built their faith, the one who's standing on the word of God. And church, these are principles when you look at it, how that God is no respecter of, of persons. These are principles about God's character that help us to understand him. And they help us to build our faith. We have to get this down in us. And even though, you know, and that's why we repeat certain things. Why? Because we need to be reminded. Right. We need to know and we need to see. Now I want to give you a couple of truths about God that will help build your faith. And look, these are things that we know and that we've heard and that everybody knows. But we got to look at it. We got to see because there's something there that we all need to take our faith to another level. Number one, God is a creator. Number one, God is a creator. So get this down in your spirit because Ecclesiastes 12, one says this, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. See the word creator. That means he can make something new. That's never been here before. He can create something out of nothing. What does that mean for you and me today? That means there's no shortage. There's no shortage. There's no end. And if there isn't. If there's no, if there's no end. And, and, and we know that we need something. That God has promised that he's going to provide for we can know that he'll make it happen. That's right. Even though we can't see the way, we don't see it at all. And the next thing you know, it just comes in. It's like, woo, or God just does it. He repairs that relationship. He, 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 gets, he, he takes care of that bill or whatever it is. He takes care of that pain in your body. Whatever it may be, whatever promise it is, God is a creator. There is no shortage when it comes to him. He can create something. We're a new creature made out of new materials. That's literally what the word says. That's the Greek. Number two, God is good. God is good. Now, we say that all the time. And then we'll say that phrase right there. God is good. And we'll say all the time. And many of us hear that statement. And we go, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. But do we really, really believe that God is good? That God is good? Because, you see, we'll say that in one breath, but then on another breath, we're speaking doubt about God providing something for us. We'll say it, I mean, so it's like two things out of our mind. We're like, oh, I serve a good, good father, and we will sing the song. Lift our hands and the tear will start to come out of our eye. Lord, you're so good. And we'll do that. And then the next moment, we are all torn up. The relationship is all goofed up. The bank account don't look the way it is. And I got a limp. Oh, my Lord. It's all hitting me. 
I don't know. And then we get on the phone and we call up all of our friends and we're whining and complaining about it going on and on. And then on Sunday, (laughs) you're a good, good father. (laughs) And look, I'm telling you, I'm guilty. I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to myself. So we say it, but do we believe it? Now look, Matthew 7 says this. Look at this, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be. Listen to this language in these verses. I'm reading over them, but listen, let's start over. Let's go back to verse seven. Look at this. Ask and it what? Will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. See the language there. There's no doubt in that sentence. There's no doubt in that verse whatsoever. Do you see any doubt? I don't see any doubt. There's nothing there. Jesus is speaking. He's speaking very confidently and he's telling you to have confidence. Mm -hmm. Amen. Verse eight, for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Uh, That'd be bad. I don't like snakes. Just for all those who don't know, I am extremely scared of snakes. So if I ask something good from my father, I I, I know he's not going to give me a snake because I don't want snakes. But look, if I was in love with snakes, I'm all about snakes. I'm looking for another one. And I asked for one for my birthday. He might come and give me a snake. But I, I don't like snakes. I don't like snakes. And that's why I don't want that, you know, from my father. I don't want the bad things. I don't expect the bad things. I expect the good things. Look at there, verse 11. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Mm, This is good. First of all, we have to look at this phrase, your father. See, I have an earthly father. He's sitting here today. You guys don't see him on camera, but he is sitting right here. And see, I have a father and I know that when I asked him for something and I knew that I needed it, he would provide that for me to the best of his ability because he was a good father. And maybe you didn't have a good father growing up, but I know you have a good heavenly father. This I know. I know this to be true. I just saw what time it was and we got so much more notes. Oh my goodness. But Listen to this. He is a good father. And when you go to him and he's in heaven, he's going to give good things to those who ask him. He's going to give good things. So it's not, I I didn't pray enough to make God be good. No, God was, he's good all the time. He's already good. You don't pray him into being good. That's not how it works. God is good all by himself. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need my help. He's already good. So we don't have to come to him like on eggshells or something because he's not the father that just is moody. You know how like sometimes you can, you know, maybe you can get moody. I've, I've been moody before. And I've done this even to my kids. My son's laughing. He's over here behind the computer. He's smiling. He knows because he could come to me and most of the time, hey, I'm, I'm good to go. We're going to talk and I'm, I'm in a good mood most of the time. But hey, there could be some times where I'm not, I may not be in such a good mood. And, he, and he, it's not his fault. And he comes and he'll ask something and I just, well, I don't know, just, you know, and I just get irritated, real frustrated. See, God never does that. Amen. He's the perfect good father. See, See, where I, where, I, where I have shortcomings, he does not. Amen. So he's already good. You don't have to twist his arm to be good. You don't have to go on eggshells going, God, if it's okay, could you please? No, you don't have to do any of that because, see, here's the thing. He can't wait to do something good for you. He doesn't need to be provoked to do something good. That's tempting God. We don't need to do any of those things. We come to him. And look, you say, well, I've done all that. Look, do it again. 
go to God in faith and then stand believing and don't believe anything else other than it It is going to happen. If it's in the word and it aligns up with his will, then you just keep on believing. I don't care what, uh, what it looks like. You keep on till you keep on. Abraham, and we're going to talk about Abraham. He believed the promise all the way to the end, all the way to his grave. I will stand and believe God what he has promised me all the way to the end. No matter what it looks like with my natural eye, I will continue to believe. Hallelujah. See, here's the thing. Most of the time, we're our, we're, we're our own worst enemy. You can go ahead and black that screen out. We're our own worst enemy. When it comes to receiving the promises of God, we mess ourselves up. You know, we think, oh, it's God or it's this circle or these people or this or that. Most of the time it's us. God wants to flow his blessings through like a, imagine, imagine like a, like a pipeline, like a pipe. And it's just like, there's a pipe. I'm, I'm at the end of the pipeline, you know, and God wants to just flow through that. But, but many times we gum up the pipeline. We stop it up. If you've been alive for a certain length of time and you have a house and you've had it been living for a while in a house, you know that eventually at some point or one time or another, your sink's going to back up, you know, or you've seen that maybe not in the house you're in. Maybe it was another house, whatever. Okay. So maybe your sink didn't, the toilet, I'm sure at some point or another clogged up and you needed a plunger to get that thing unclogged. I just got a visual. I got to stop. Okay. So we'll go back to the kitchen sink. So the sink is all backed up. What do you need to get that thing cleaned out? It's a rotor rooter. You need that thing, that, that device. And, you know, dad went and bought one one time, you know, and it has a, um, uh, it has a foot pedal thing or a fit, foot thing. And you, it's electrical, and you step on it, and it goes, and that thing just goes through, and it'll sit there, and it just cleans the inside of that big pipe out. Just cleans it all out. So therefore, now the flow, it's, it's, it's coming, and there's no restriction to the flow. And we need to get ourselves cleaned out from all the negative stuff that's in there, that's gummed it up. Because see, a pipe on the outside, you can't tell if it's gummed up. See, on the outside, it looks all right. And see, sometimes we walk around and we put our smile on, but the, really on the inside, there's some stuff going on. There's some stuff that's, that's all gummed up. Stuff like bitterness, unforgiveness, jealousy, mm, envy, strife, anger. See, we got to get all that stuff cleaned out because the flow of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long suffering. Hallelujah. Amen. See, that's the flow of the spirit. And so when we got to get all that stuff gummed out, all the gum and all this stuff that just backs it all up. And we got to get that rotor rooter called the spirit of God to come through and just get rid of all that stuff in the pipe. Then see that thing would go in a circular motion. I remember that it would just go and it would just go around. And so you just get the fruit of the spirit and just take one every day and let it just cycle through your week. It'll change your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I remember the, uh, you know, the women, they did, they, in, in the coffee, tea, you and me in the group, they were doing the, the, the fruit of the spirit. And I thought, man, that is so good because that's what we need to get rid of all that stuff in that pipe to allow the flow of the blessings of God to come. Church, it's not about religion. It's all about getting the, the most of God that you can get. Religion is walking in a form. It's walking in by a list of rules. Get before God and allow God to change you in your spirit. Get on your knees and begin to go cry out to God and say, God, I need to love others. I need to have that joy. I need to have your peace. I need to have your comfort, your long suffering towards others. Hallelujah. I need to get all of you that I can get. It's about increasing my faith so that I can be blessed, so I can be a blessing to others. Hallelujah. Church, I got a question for you. How much of God do you want? Are you satisfied with just a little, a little bit, or do you want more? I want the more. I want to be in the more. And maybe you're in the word all the time. God bless you. Continue to do that and get the more. But for those of you where you have the word, but it sits on your, your, your counter somewhere, it sits there and it just and you, on your shelf and you never pick it up. And there's like dust and you could write your name and carve your name in it. 
in the dust. Pick it up and get into the word of God. Begin to seek after God with all your heart. He said, seek first the righteousness of God. And then all these things are going to be added to you. So if I get in this word and I seek him, if I know what the word of God says, and I cry out to him for a personal revival in myself, then I can begin to affect others and begin to change the world around me and bring about a revival in my house, in my community, in my workplace, wherever I go. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hebrews 12, verse 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. See, it, it, it defiles. That root bitterness will mess you up. Get rid of that. It will defile you and it hinders the blessings of God from flowing in your life. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau for one, for who, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently for tear, tear, with tears. That repent means to change one mind. See the blessing and the birthright, it was already given to Jacob, his brother. And he went and tried to go crying out to God all of a sudden after he had done messed up and done all this. And he said, God didn't change his mind. Look, this isn't about heaven and hell. This is because Esau, I believe Esau's in heaven. I believe he is. What I'm trying to tell you here is that when it comes to the blessings of God, being flowing in your life when it comes to so see there was a birthright and there was a blessing the birthright is who he was is who you are the position you have in the family and then there was the blessing that came afterwards and see Esau he didn't care about the position and who he was he just wanted to be blessed and see so many times we won't walk in who we're supposed to be we, and we're just wanting the blessings and we're wondering why the blessings aren't flowing oh it's because we're not work, walking in who we are we're not taking the authority that we have in Jesus Christ. We're not looking at Ephesians chapter 6 and putting on the whole armor of God so I can stand in the evil day. We just think that, oh, it's just pie in the sky. It's going to happen. Be, oh, I'm, the blessings are just supposed to be for, for me and everybody. No, no, no. It comes to those children who know who they are in the family and they're coming to that good, good father because they know he's good. And they're coming in with, with the right attitude, with the right spirit, and they know that they're obeying the voice just as we start started off in the very beginning in Deuteronomy and all those blessings will flow if I obey the voice of the Lord my God the spirit that is within me hallelujah church Esau missed it he missed it you don't want to miss, miss a visitation of God in your life see <laughs> Jacob got the visitation he wrestled with God <clears throat> Excuse me. But see, Esau, he was more concerned about his natural belly and the things of this world than his spiritual belly. I'm about to blow somebody's mind. See, Jacob, even though he was a deceiver and he lied to get his blessing, God blessed him anyways. Now, see, that's backwards. In all of our thinking, it was like he was saying, Jacob, you were so hungry. You were willing to do anything. I'm going to bless you anyways. I'd rather bless a liar who was hungry for God than a guy who didn't want God to begin with. I, I told you. Think about that. It's the word. It, it, if you're listening at home and you don't believe me, it's in Genesis. Go check it. God blessed a liar over somebody who didn't want God. Jacob at least wanted God. He was hungry and he was willing to do anything. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Look, I'm not telling you to go out here and do some lie. What I'm trying to tell you, are you hungry for God to do whatever it takes to, to get the hole in your knees, you know, in your pants? Where your knees hit the ground and they've been there so long, it's got you got a mark. I remember I used to play in my jeans and go outside. My mom used to put patches. How many remember patches? 
right? Some of us, we need to get on our knees. Whew. Hallelujah. I know it doesn't make much sense to some of you. I, I, but God looked past Jacob's weakness. God wasn't looking at Jacob for perfection. He was looking at his heart. He was looking at what was motivating him. He was looking for relationship. Jacob was so hungry that he was willing to do anything. God was blessing the hunger in Jacob's heart. He wasn't blessing the deceiving. Get this, church. He's not, he wasn't blessing that. He was blessing that hunger in his heart. He was saying, I can work with that. I can work with that. Mm. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. God, may we get this. Lord, may we get this, that we would be hungry for you. Lord, that we would hunger and thirst after righteousness so that we can be filled. Romans chapter 4 verse 11. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised. But only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but I want you to look at this phrase right here, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. Amen. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift and we are all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. I want you to go back to verse 13. A right relationship with God that comes by faith. It wasn't about being circumcised. It wasn't about following this list of do's and don'ts in the law. See, Abraham had faith before he was circumcised, before there was a law. God spoke to Abraham and had a relationship with Abraham before any of that happened. Abraham's faith came directly from the mouth of God. He received the promise directly from him. And we can all have the same faith that Abraham had. You don't get the blessing from keeping the law. You get it through the promise. Amen. You've got to believe the promise. See, the fulfillment of the promise that Abraham was given was Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. The law is your own efforts and your works. That's why God gave Abraham the promise before the law. You can't work out getting blessings on your own. You have to follow what the Lord says and be led by the Spirit. You can't write down a list of do's and don'ts and follow it and get the blessings. That's not what it's about. Your, right, your righteousness with God is not because of something you did. It's because of what God said. He says so. He says, you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, not because of your works, but because of your faith in, in me. That's it. We continue reading in Romans in verse 17, and this is the last scripture, well, second to last scripture I'm going to give you. <laughs> this is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. <clears throat> this happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. And they still had a child. Woo Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. Verse 21 he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. In the King James, this is fully persuaded. <clears throat> My question here is, are you fully persuaded 
that God can bless you just as much as you see him blessing all these other people that you desire to be blessed. Like, he believed, Abraham believed according to what was spoken. Abraham didn't have anything to base his faith on that he was going to be the father of many nations except the promise of God. <clears throat> that was it. Abraham was fully convinced. We've got to get fully convinced. How do we do that? Is we've got to get a word from God. That's how it all started with Abraham. He heard it directly from him. And so do you have a word from God so that you can be fully convinced? Fully persuaded. You have a whole Bible <clears throat> full of promises right here. But not only the written word of God, but the rhema word. Amen. The word that God spoke to your heart. I'm hoping you have a rhema word of God. Everyone listen, I hope you do. And if you have not gotten a rhema word of God, you need to get it. What do I mean by that? Romans 10, 17, last verse. <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema of God. See, the word... The word word here in this verse in the Greek is rhema, which means an utterance, that which is or has been uttered by the living voice, things spoken. See, the other th word that you will see, and it, you see it a lot more, it's like 300 and sometimes, is logos. Logos means this, something said, including the thought, by implication, a topic, subject of discourse, also reasoning, the mental facu faculty or motive. <clears throat> so you study the logos mm -hmm. to show yourself approved. You'll see that word, the, the word word in that verse in Timothy is logos. But what is the spirit uttering to you about the specific verses when you study the logos? Are you getting a rhema word from God when you study the logos of the word, the words that are written? We study that not just so we can just you know, oh, I can follow this or that because I know I have to so I can get to heaven. We follow it and we look at it and we seek after it and we pray and we seek after what the Spirit is saying. See, when I study and I look, God's given me a word about it, something that's different than just the actual meaning of the verse. God's given me something extra. And that's what the rhema is. And so when you get before God, say, God, I need a rhema word. I need your spirit to speak to me in a mighty way. Hallelujah. My voice is gone. That means I'm done. Amen. We're going to pray. And we're going to believe God. That if you, if you don't have a rhema word, that you would get a rhema word. God can speak to you directly. And those are the words that really, really change you. Amen. They really, really change you. When God speaks to your heart. And that's when we're, you know, the hunger is stirred up. And the thirst for God is stirred up in our soul. And we began to run after him with everything that we have. So let's pray that we would get a rhema word of God, that the hunger of God would be stirred in our heart so our faith would go to another level Amen. in him. Father, right now, we just thank you. We just praise you for today. Lord, I thank you for speaking to each one under the sound of my voice that you would give them a word specific for them. Lord, if there's an area that needs to change, Lord, that we would have our pipe all cleaned out, Lord, that we would change that. But Lord, I thank you that we would get a rhema word so that we would be fully persuaded, fully convinced, just like Abraham was, God. Lord, we need to be fully convinced so that we can stand on your word and faith believing so that your blessings would flow and that we would be a blessing to others. Lord, that we would experience your miracles. Lord, that we would have healing, that relationships would be prepared, repaired. Lord, that money would flow where it needs to flow. Provision, Father God, in Jesus' name. 
We come against lack and commanded to go. We come against division and divisiveness and commanded to go. Right now, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for unity and unifying us. Lord, that we would be hungry for you so that we can love others in the way that you would have us to love others. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.